Hi everyone, Pastor Peter here, and thanks for joining us. We're doing something a little bit new here today, online Bible study, and uh, I'm excited to join you all in this. We'll kind of see how it goes. Uh, my first time doing it, I think, so I uh, got some things to work out, some uh, technology to learn, and so I just hope you bear with me. If I could just give you a, a little kind of glimpse into what I'm thinking about for this time. I'm looking to spend just about 20 minutes with you, that's all. I don't want to spend too much longer than that. I'll aim for 20 minutes each time. And for now, what we're going to do is take a look at the Bible passage that we'll be preaching on in the coming weekend. And so we have been working our way through Genesis. We're going to be in Exodus this Sunday. And so I just want to give you a little uh, foretaste of that Sunday reading. Uh, maybe give you some time to think about it so when you show up on Sunday, not hearing this Bible passage for the first time, but uh, you've learned a little bit about it, you've let the Word of God sink into your heart and, and mind, and that way when you come to Sunday, you can kind of mine the depths of God's Word with us as we preach. And so uh, that's my, kind of my hope, uh, to give us a little glimpse of Sunday morning, prepare us for, for that, and to spend about 20 minutes. And again, today we're going to be in the book of Exodus chapter 3. We left off with the, the story of Jacob, and uh, to be quite honest, a lot has happened since then, but we'll, we'll get to that for a, uh, in just a second. I do want to ask you a, a question uh, to start off, one I want you to be thinking about the whole time. Actually, two questions. The first is, what is the way to God? How do we get a relationship to God? If you had a friend who was seeking after God, wanted to know more about him or how to connect with God, right? Like, what would you tell that person? What is the way to God? Be thinking about that, because I think the story has something about that to say to us. Uh, the other question that I want us to think about is, where have I seen this before? Uh, this passage has so many different connections to different Bible stories, which I think is kind of exciting to see how the Bible is one cohesive story and how it's kind of linking to other parts of the story throughout. So just be asking yourself uh, those two questions. Where have I seen this before? And uh, what is the way to God? Again, I, I think uh, the story of Moses and the burning bush will, will have something to say about those two questions for us. So uh, let's do a, a little bit of background first before we dive into Exodus chapter 3. Uh, so if you want to open your Bible to the last uh, page of the book of Genesis, that'll be maybe where we kind of uh, begin today. Uh, Genesis chapter 50, specifically verse uh, 26. So we left off with Jacob, the grandson of Abraham. Uh, you might remember God promised Abraham a huge family would come from him promised that this family would come to live in the promised land. Uh, we get to Jacob, his, his grandson, and then Joseph, Jacob's son. And what we find at the end of the book of Genesis is that that special family from Abraham is now living outside of the promised land. Uh, they're no longer there. Uh, through Joseph, they've come to live in Egypt. And they'll do pretty well for themselves, at least under Joseph's leadership in Egypt. But they're not in the promised land. Uh, of course, God is always with them, but in, in another sense, they're, they're away from God's presence, away from his land of promise. And so we, we read there in Genesis 50, Joseph died at the age of 110, and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. And that, that's leading to some tension within the story. Uh, maybe you've heard me say or others say that the, the book of Genesis and really the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, really the whole Bible, is this story about how God wants to be with his people. Right? It's what Genesis begins with. God creates this world for no other good reason than he wants to be with us, his people. And even though we push him away through our sin, right, God constantly draws us back. Adam and Eve push themselves out of the garden, but God continued to draw them in. He promised them in Genesis 3.15 to send them a savior. He wasn't going to give up on them. And story after story in Genesis, we see this keep coming back. Us pushing God away through sin, him drawing us back. And of course, this is kind of comes to its fulfillment, its culmination in Jesus, where God says, I, I want to be with you forever. So I'm going to send my own son who's going to live and die and rise for you. He's going to be Emmanuel, God with you. He's never going to leave you. And so that's the, the fulfillment of that story. But we see the tension within the story building up right there in Genesis chapter 50. The people are not living in the promised land like God had promised they would be. So what's going to happen next? What's going to happen when we get to Exodus? Well, 
we uh, get to Exodus and we read that uh, in verse 8 of Exodus chapter 1 that there is a, a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing. That king came to power in Egypt. And look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. So now on the one hand, things are happening as God said they would. The, the, the family of Abraham has grown to be huge. They're so numerous, but that's causing a problem for Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt, because he's worried about this large growing family and the threat that that poses to his power. And so he says at the end of uh, chapter 1 in verse 22, he says, Every Hebrew boy that is born you must throw into the Nile, but ev let every girl live. Uh, all right, now I asked you that question at the beginning. Where have I seen this before? Where have I heard this before? And here's maybe you're getting the first glimpse of that. Can you think of another story where some maniacal king tries to kill all the baby boys? Story of Jesus, right? What happened to Moses in his day? Moses was one of those baby boys that Pharaoh was trying to kill. Happens in the life uh, of Jesus as well. There's some some pretty interesting connections there, and that's just the first one. Uh, but in fact, Moses, in many ways, is kind of a Christ-like figure. Uh, of course, he was uh, a maniacal king tried to kill him, along with all the other baby boys, just like what happened with uh, Jesus. Uh, but Moses, we'll come to learn, was also a shepherd, like Jesus, our good shepherd. And uh, there's, there's a few more, but we'll, we'll maybe get to those uh, along the way. And so uh, into uh, the people of Israel, while they're living in Egypt, Moses is born. And here we come to chapter 2. His mom knows about the fact that Pharaoh is trying to kill her son, along with the other boys. So she's determined to save him. And it says in chapter 2, verse 3, But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. And his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Now, we don't have uh, the time to kind of cover the whole story of Moses. Uh, but here's another interesting connecting. Where have I seen this before? Can you think of another man earlier in this story who went into a little boat that sat upon the water that got rescued? This is the story of Noah replaying itself over again. And in fact, the ark was coated with tar and pitch. I think it's the only two times in the Bible, Noah and Moses, that something is described in that way. Well, there's so many cool connections here with the rest of the Bible. But bigger point being, God has, uh, has rescued Moses, taken care of him, and uh, watched over him this whole time. And so Moses, although he's an Israelite boy, is, is not killed. In fact, he, he grows up in Pharaoh's household, in the household of Egypt. Uh, but when we meet him in chapter 3, he is now a shepherd tending to the flock of his father-in-law. So that's where we'll pick up. And maybe I'll just read some of chapter 3, and uh, we'll just kind of talk about it as we go. Now it says, chapter 3, verse 1 of Exodus. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, or another name for Horeb that maybe you've heard is Mount Sinai, same place, just two different names for it, came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So this is a really important passage. So here's Moses. And again, he's tending his sheep, kind of minding his own business. He's on the mountain of God. So this is a special place to God. And there's this tree there, some translations call it a bush, that is burning, right? And even though it's on fire, it's not burning up. Now, a couple of cool connections. Again, I'm going to put this up again. Where have I seen this before? Where have you heard about a tree that proves to be a testing place for God's people? God is going to be kind of testing Moses here, showing up in the tree. Will Moses respond? Will he be a part of God's plan or not? Where else have you heard about a tree becoming a place of testing? Well, this is the Garden of Eden, right? Um, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Again, we see 
God kind of testing Moses here in a very similar way with a, a tree. The story is drawing us back to the beginning of Genesis. Uh, but then it's interesting. There's something unique about this tree. Again, it's on fire, right? Uh, flames of fire came from within the bush. But Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. Okay, can you think about a story in the Bible where there is a fire, but something placed into the fire is not consumed? Uh, this is the story of, from Daniel of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Right? They go into the fire and they're not burned up. Okay, some interesting connections there, but what's going on? Well, a fire in the Old Testament and smoke are often signs of God's presence and his glory. Uh, but maybe we'll talk about that in uh, just a minute. Let's go on a little bit further. But just keep that in mind. Fire is God's presence and his glory. Let's keep reading. Moses sees all this and he thinks, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. Verse 4 says, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. All right. Now, I asked you at the beginning to ask two questions, right? Where have I seen this before? But also, what is the way to God? Someone were looking to find God, what would you tell them? And I think one of the things we're seeing already here in, in this story, the story of Moses, is that the way to God begins with God, right? He is the one who initiates the relationship. Uh, he is the one who descends down from heaven and enters into our life. As we'll see, God is the one who calls us before we ever say a word to him. And this is good news, <laughs> Right? That God does not wait around for us to figure him out or find our way to him or climb our way up some ladder to reach up into heaven. That God is always coming down to us. He came down, descended into to Moses' life, showed up to him there in a burning bush on top of a, a mountain. And this was a gift. Because again, if it was up to Moses, he might still be wandering around that desert following his sheep. But God came into to his life. And what's re really interesting about this story of, of Moses is that what happens to Moses here on Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, God wants to do for all of the people. Moses gets to experience it first, but God wants to give that same gift to the people later. And so Moses experiences God in a flame of fire on top of the mountain, gets to encounter the divine. And by the end of the story, the last page of Exodus, all of God's people are gathered around the tabernacle where the glory of God descends and fire and, and smoke. And they get to enter the divine presence mediated through the tabernacle, but they get to, to come into God's presence again. And in that case, in the tabernacle, it was all because of God's initiative, right? He's the one who gave the plan for the tabernacle. He set the rules in motion. So God shows up in Moses' life here in the mountain in a wonderful, beautiful way. And he wants to do the same thing for Israel. Moses experiences first, but the point is that what Moses gets, God wants to give to all of the, the people, his whole family. Such a cool story. But again, what is the way to God? Well, it starts with God. In, in one sense, it's a one-way street from God down to us. Uh, but let's read a, a little bit further. Uh, let's pick up in verse 5. It says, Do not come any closer, God said. Not come any closer. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Uh, to be holy is to be clean and pure first. You can't be dirty and unclean to be holy. It's to be clean and holy, but also to be set apart, to be different. And God is that. He is clean, pure, pure and he is totally different. And so when you come into God's presence, you got to take off your shoes, because shoes are not clean. <laughs> Uh, it's not that they're sinful, it's just that Moses has been walking around the sheep fields all day. And this is a sacred holy space. And to embody that, God says, take off your shoes. Recognize with your very being that you're approaching the holy divine. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I'm, I'm the God who's been with you this whole time working in your life. I, I never really left. I'm still here. Don't give up on me. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God because he realized his own sinfulness and God's holiness. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people. Now check out these three important words. I have seen the misery of my people. I have heard them crying because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their sufferings. What good news this is. 
to anyone here today who is hurting, anyone who's lonely, anyone who's feeling totally forgotten or broken, what a beautiful promise that God sees us, he hears us, and he's concerned about us. He doesn't just see us and hear us and then turn away, like turn a cold shoulder. No, he sees, he hears, and he actually cares. And what does that compassion do, that the concern do? It, it means that he comes down to rescue them. He comes down to rescue. God sees, he hears, he's concerned, and he rescues. And there's no better fulfillment of this, of course, than Jesus. Jesus came because God saw and heard. He was concerned. And so he descended down into heaven and he rescued us. We're getting a, a, little, a little preview of the Jesus story right here in the, the story of Moses. And I, again, I think we need to just kind of dwell on this, the, the beautiful truths that it tells us about who our, our God is, that he, he does see us. When, they, when the people of Israel felt totally forgotten, right, when they were oppressed and hurting, God says, no, 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 don't think this means I've forgotten you or that I've given up on you. In fact, just the opposite. I hear you, I see you, I care, I'm concerned, and I want to rescue you. Uh, this is such good news. And so he's going to do what he had promised them to do. He's going to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. He's going to bring them into the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hiv Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of Israel has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. That's kind of amazing if you think of it. I am sending you, Moses, uh, a man who had just not that long ago committed murder, uh, a simple shepherd serving his father-in-law. God is going to use him. But not only does God rescue us, he also empowers us and enables us to, to be involved, to share in his work. This is amazing, right? I think of people like Peter, who denied Jesus three times. And Jesus doesn't only forgive him, but says, I'm going to keep on using you. Peter, feed my sheep. I think of the Apostle Paul who had breathed threats against God's people. And God says, I'm not only going to forgive you for your murderous ways, but I'm going to use you, Paul, to spread the gospel all over the world. And what does that say to us? That God sees us, hears us, he rescues us, but he also wants to use us. He wants to use you. And I don't know what that would look like, but it was true of Moses, and I think it's true of us. But maybe like us, Moses has some, some objections to that. In fact, Moses will have five objections to God uh, overall. He'll, uh, he'll say things like, uh, who am I, as he says in verse 11. Uh, but then later he'll, he'll protest and he'll say, look, the people won't believe me, or we don't even know who you are, or I'm not eloquent, or just, hey God, how about sending someone else? But God doesn't give it up. He doesn't give up on his people. He doesn't give up on Moses. When God wants something done, he's going to get it done. And so God says, I will be with you. Again, you can't have to think about Jesus. Emmanuel, God is with us. And he even gives a sign to them uh, that they will worship God on the mountain. Uh, Moses said, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am. Uh, that God is God. Uh, he's the God who was and who is and who always will be. Sometimes we doubt or wonder about the reality of God and God says, there's nothing more real than me. <laughs> what a beautiful promise uh, that is. So, so much good stuff here in the story of Moses. And I hope that just kind of gets us started thinking about his story. I think it reminds us that God initiates our relationship with him. And, and that's good news, that he doesn't wait for us to figure it out or get on the right track or find the way, but he descends into our lives uh, because he loves us so much. He wants to be with us. And I, I think it tells us that God wants to use us. Right? He, uh, despite ourselves sometimes, despite our limitations, God wants to accomplish his work through us. And yet he's in control, so we don't have to worry that we're going to get it wrong or get in the way of his plans because God's will is always, is always accomplished. Uh, and so it's a wonderful story for us. I, I hope it's one that we can relate to. And I look forward to hearing more about it this weekend with you. 
and worship. So hope to see you at St. Paul this weekend to worship either Saturday night at 5 o'clock or Sunday morning at 9 o'clock as we dig even further into the story of Moses to see what else God has to say for us. Well, God bless you all and hope to see you again next week.